Okay, here we are with the anesthetic machine. The purpose of this video is to demystify this machine, take all the mystery away from all of its components and all of its parts. There shouldn't be a single part on this machine that is a mystery or um, that is an un unknown to you. So you're going to be able to go through this machine or any machine like it and be able to identify all of its pieces. So when you do that, what I recommend is that you go ahead and start with a source of oxygen and then follow the oxygen through um, identifying every single component on the way. In this case, we have E tanks. E is for emergency, um, and these are portable tanks. Then there's also H tanks, which H is for huge. Those are usually in the back of the, of the building, connected to a network of green tubing that then comes down from the ceilings in each of the rooms of the hospital. If we had a H tank set up, this hose would connect directly into uh, one of those connectors in the room coming down from the ceiling. We don't have that set up today, so we're going to be working off the E tanks. Okay, you've got two E-tanks here. The one on your right is marked as in use by this tab. The one on your left is marked as full. I do recommend uh, paying close attention to these, to these uh, tabs and using them in practice as they will help you aid in the identification of a full tank or an empty tank. So let's see how much of this in use tank has been used. I'll go ahead and open this up. When I do that, remember right tight, left loose. When I do that, on my manometer, I see that we're just under 500 PSI. So that is telling me that I have just enough uh, oxygen here to perform a small procedure, like a cat neuter or maybe even a dog neuter if I'm working with a fast veterinarian. Um, however, if I anticipate a longer spay, uh, for example, or an exploratory laparotomy, then I may want to make sure that I switch this tank out so I'm not switching it in the middle of my procedure. That's going to be up to you as a practice manager or up to your practice manager. Okay. In my case, I want to make sure that I have enough. So I'm going to close this one out and I'm going to change this from in use to empty. And what I would do is I would go ahead and tear off this tab here. And by tearing that off, I would leave it as just empty, just like that. Okay. And then I would come over to this tank here and I would tear off the full and I would leave it as just being in use. By tearing off the full, I would show that this is the one that we're using now, okay? So let's go ahead and open our new tank that's in use. Again, right tight, left loose. When I go left, you can see that this tank has above 2,000 PSI of pressure in there or of oxygen, okay? It tells me I have a brand new tank, plenty of oxygen for at least a few procedures, so I'm good to go, okay? Now, You'll see that the tank is connected to the rest of the machine via a yoke. That's this device here, the yoke. This is a device that holds the tank in place and you'll want to be careful to make sure that you install the tank properly and take it off properly, always being sure uh, not to topple the tank over or break off this piece that fits into the yoke. Because if you do that, you have to remember the oxygen gas in there is under very high pressure and it would be a hazard. Okay, from the yoke, we connect to the rest of the machine. You'll notice that then we go through the uh, manometer that tells us how much oxygen we have. We already talked about that. Just behind that, we have our first major component, which is our pressure reducing valve. The pressure reducing valve reduces the pressure of the oxygen coming out of the tank from, let's say, 2,000 PSI to 50 PSI. If we only had 500 PSI left in our tank, it still reduces it down to 50. So it reduces it down to about 50 PSI. Because the pressure that's coming out of here at 2,000 PSI would blow away most of the components of our machine. It's too much pressure. We have to reduce it via the pressure reducing valve to a usable level. And that's what that does. Once we get it down to about 50 PSI, we continue through this green hose and it enters our flow meter. So this is our flow meter right here, shown here in this component. A couple things can happen at our flow meter. One, we can set the flow of oxygen to our vaporizer in this flow meter anywhere from zero to about four and a half. Okay? This, this one is set to about zero to four and a half liters per minute. Now notice I know I can read my flow meter via that little ball that's in there and I read the, I read the flow meter by where we are in the center of the ball. So right there I am at two liters of oxygen per minute. This is not two liters and this is not two liters center of the ball is two liters. Okay. One thing about using this dial on the flow meter is that you don't have to crank it. You can open it gently and you get a change in the reading. You can also close it 
And as soon as I hit zero, that's it, I'm at zero. I don't have to crank this shut, okay? Like you do some of the other devices like the yoke. You don't have to do that with this because you know that you don't have any flow of oxygen because you can see that on the dial, okay? So be careful, this is a fragile, fragile dial. So that's one thing that can happen. I can set my oxygen to my vaporizer. The other thing that can ha happen here is that I can by bypass my vaporizer completely via the O2 flush button, okay? That's this button here, okay? You hear the oxygen flushing past the vaporizer and directly into the breathing circuit, which we're gonna talk about in a second. One thing to keep in mind, you hear the oxygen going. It sounds like it's going at a high flow because it in fact indeed is. Remember, all we've reduced down to is about 50 PSI. When I push this, I am sending that pressure of oxygen at around 50, maybe a little bit less uh, PSI to the rest of the system, to the breathing circuit. I gotta keep that in mind. If I continue through my flow meter, and we'll talk about the, the vaporizer in a little bit, but if I continue through my flow meter, I will reduce my 50 PSI um, oxygen down to about 12 to 15 PSI, okay? When I use the O2 flush, that doesn't happen. So I have to keep that in mind, okay? But let's go ahead and continue through the flow meter. So if I go up to the top of the flow meter and out the back, I go through this hose here. This hose goes back to the front, right here, and into the vaporizer inlet. Now I went through the flow meter, so this oxygen is coming in at 12 PSI. I've reduced it down to 12 PSI. I go to the vaporizer, and this is where I mix my liquid anesthetic as I poured it in with my oxygen and I turn my liquid on anesthetic into a vapor or gas via the use of the precision vaporizer. Remember what we talked about in lecture? The precision vaporizer is a specialized device calibrated to, you, to be used specific to a certain machine uh, and it's specific to that, I'm sorry, to a certain gas and it's specific to that gas's vapor pressure. Okay? The reason we can't just use the gas without a vaporizer is because the vapor pressure would cause that gas to equilibrate at very high levels. We would have a 33, 50% uh, uh, anesthetic gas and oxygen mixture, and that would not be clinically use usable. So the primary function of the vaporizer is to dilute the anesthetic gas to a clinically, be clinically usable level by converting it from a liquid to a gas and mixing it with oxygen. Then we pick up the anesthetic gas. The oxygen picks up the anesthetic gas in here in the vaporizer and then it comes out through the vaporizer outlet. What is leaving the vaporizer is now a mixture of anesthetic gas and oxygen. Notice this dial. I can set how much anesthetic gas leaves the outlet via this dial and these are my different percentages. So for isofluorine, which is what this vaporizer is for, um, it has one, two, three, up to 5% um, of what leaves the vaporizer can be anesthetic gas. So as I take that through here, my outlet then comes up through here and into my inspiratory, my one-way unidirectional inspiratory valve, okay? Now you'll notice back here as well, while we're back here, we're gonna talk about the O2 bypass. So you notice here we have a little Y connector and there's another circuit that's coming into this. The reason there's another circuit that's coming into this is because if you remember, that was our O2 bypass. When I press this button, what I'm doing is I'm sending oxygen, bypassing the flow meter, bypassing the um, vaporizer and sending oxygen from this green hose directly into this hose and up into the inspiratory, one-way unidirectional inspiratory valve, okay? That's what I meant by this button bypasses the vaporizer and sends air, or oxygen I should say, directly into the patient, okay? So, my one-way unidirectional inspiratory valve, that one also has a valve above it which is called the negative pressure safety valve. What that does is if for whatever reason in my system we experience negative pressure, in other words, the pressure falls below zero, then that will allow a little bit of atmospheric air into the system to, um, to stabilize it, okay? So that's a safety feature, very important safety feature so that we don't get uh, below zero in our pressure. From here, the one-way inspiratory valve sends 
the anesthetic gas and oxygen mixture into the patient via this coaxial vein circuit. This is a rebreathing circuit. And we'll talk about circuits in a separate video, but this is a rebreathing circuit. The inspiratory air is going through the middle tube. It's called coaxial because coaxial just means one tube inside of another. So the inner tube, and then that's where the patient breathes. When the patient exhales, they exhale into the outer tube and exhale into the outer tube and to the exhalation unidirectional valve. Now notice that when the patient exhales, they are producing warm air that is surrounding the fresh incoming inhalation air. So that is actually warming the inhalation air and that's an added uh, thermoregulation feature of this coaxial vein circuit. Okay. As we get to this point here and we exhaled, uh, we redirect the exhaled air to the expiratory unidirectional valve. This is a one-way valve that only flutters on exhalation, as I will demonstrate by exhaling into the circuit, and you see the valve flutters. Okay? If I were to inhale, only the inhalation valve will flutter. Since I did at one point turn on my vaporizer, I'm not going to do that if there might be some of the gas stuck inside. Okay, so when I exhale, that flutters. You can use that as a visual cue for respiration. In the case that the pet is draped and you're not able to see the chest expand and contract, you can use that as a cue for respiration and count the respiratory rate. Other thing that's featured on here is this valve here. This is uh, referred to as the positive pressure releasing valve, sometimes also called the pop-off valve for short. And what this does is if there's any excess pressure in the system, not negative, excess pressure in the system, this allows a, that excess pressure to escape via the scavenger system. Okay? So the next step from here is the scavenger system. There's two places that the expired air can go. If it's an, an excess pressure or if it's built up in the system, it will go into the scavenger, which is this hose here. The other place that it can go is that it can be recycled back in to the inspiratory system via this CO2 canister, okay? So let's first talk about the scavenger. So if we go down the scavenger hose, we see here we have a portable unit, we have a fare canister. The fare canister has activated charcoal in it, which helps to neutralize any expired anesthetic gas so that we don't affect the atmosphere or get it into the room, um, etc. This fair canister will gain 50 grams of weight when it has been used up. In other words, the activated charcoal will have absorbed about 50 grams of anesthetic gas. Okay? That's any excess anesthetic gas that leaves the system. We hope that most of the anesthetic gas gets used by the animal. And the way it does that is by getting recycled back into the system. So I said it could go one way, the scavenger. The other way it can go is down this tube and into this CO2 canister. If it goes into the CO2 canister, what we have in here is soda lime. The soda lime will react with the CO2 and pull it out of the circulating gas. It pulls CO2 out of the circulating gas through a chemical reaction that makes the soda lime go from a soft granular uh, structure to a very rock hard structure. So one way you can tell that your soda lime has been exhausted is by actually trying to crush it. And if you can't crush it, then it's been exhausted. But beyond that, we also have a color change that occurs. When in use, for isofluorine, when in use, you will see that the um, colors of the granules turn from white to about a violet or blue. Um, just be cautious about that because sometimes when you stop using the machine, depending on the gas that you're using, that color change may go away. So that doesn't mean that you um, are back to usable uh, soda lime. It just means that it's because you're not using the, the anesthetic gas at the moment. You still have to change it out. Okay? For that reason, we usually write on our names, our initials, and the date when we changed it last, and we keep that in mind as part of our ongoing maintenance of the machine. Okay? So, our exhaled air is coming through here, CO2 is being extracted from it, then it comes back up through this, hose, through this, uh, through this pipe right here, back into the inspiratory valve, the unidirectional inspiratory valve to be rebreathed again by the animal. This is why we're connected to a rebreathing circuit. Okay? You'll notice here you have a manometer that is in centimeters of H2O, centimeters of water. And what that manometer does is it tells you how much pressure is building up or ex being experienced by the pet. So you never want to see this go over 20 to 40. Okay? 
So you never want to see it go into the 20, 20 to 40 range. You always want to keep it under 20. Anything above 20 starts hurting the lungs of the patient. And so we want to make sure that we keep the pressure going into the patient's lungs under 20 centimeters of water. Okay. So from this point on here, you'll notice that there's also this bag. Now this bag in this machine happens to be associated location-wise with the inspiratory valve. That is just incidental. It has really nothing to do with inspiration per se. This bag is called a reservoir bag. Its purpose is to catch or to trap excess air in the system so that we don't get large fluctuations of pressure in the system. Okay. And with that, that is the machine as, um, as thorough as possible and every single component um, should be understood and every single component should be identified in this machine. Uh, with that, I think we have identified everything.